Hi, my name is Suzanne Johnson and I'm a gynaecologist from Southampton. This is a talk on how to diagnose deep endometriosis on transvaginal ultrasound. I need to warn you that this presentation contains some surgical images and some people might find these upsetting. Many people think that you cannot see endometriosis on ultrasound. This is not true and I'll show you why. Endometriosis is a very common gynaecological condition affecting around 5% of women. It's defined by the presence of stroma and glands outside of the endometrial cavity. And as these are hormonally responsive, they cause cyclical pain with bleeding, inflammation, fibrosis and adhesions. It's a very common cause of pelvic pain, causing painful periods, painful sex, pain on opening bowels during a period, subfertility, or it can be entirely asymptomatic. We're still not sure what exactly causes endometriosis. In this recent review article, um, you can see this beautiful image where this is the back of the uterus, and these are the fallopian tubes and ovaries. These are some very important ligaments at the back and the bowel. Um, and you can see in this image that you can have superficial endometriosis, or it can affect the ovaries and ovarian endometrioma, or it can be deep endometriosis, and that's the subject of this talk. There are very long delays in diagnosing women with endometriosis, and worldwide the average delay is about eight years. Many of these women have consulted their GP many times before they're referred and diagnosed. And the diagnosis can be difficult because there is significant overlap with other conditions, um, but making the diagnosis has been difficult. Um, this is an infographic from a master's student in London who's been researching the lived experience of endometriosis. And this is from 21 oral histories from women with endometriosis in the UK. Um, you can see that while they're not being referred and being diagnosed and treated, um, the, the endometriosis causes many, many different symptoms um, and I noticed that the amount of diagnostics in this image is very little and the symptoms and consequences huge and it would be nice to rebalance this. Meanwhile, for many people, a structural pelvic ultrasound is often normal and the patients are told there is nothing wrong. This leads to long delays in diagnosis. And you can see here the lower back of a 22-year-old girl who has such intense pelvic pain that she applies a hot water bottle to the skin and has caused erythema abigni, redness from fire. Her scan had been said to be normal, but it wasn't. Um, laparoscopy, therefore, is a mainstay of diagnosis. And to help you understand what a normal laparoscopy looks like, um, there's an image here of a, of a woman. This would be the laparoscope. It's where a, a camera is inserted through your belly button under general anaesthetic. And then um, the surgeon looks from this aspect, looking toward the feet. So this is the view you get toward the feet. Um, so I'll play the video and you can see this is the back of the uterus. And you can see the ovary, you can see the fallopian tubes and this is the pouch of Douglas. So you can see it's all nice and clear and that's the bowel just at the back there. So a nice clear pelvis. Whereas if somebody has severe endometriosis, this is what it can look like. You can see again the back of the uterus and you can see that the ovaries are adherent to the back of the uterus, the bowel is adherent and there are so many adhesions it's really hard to know what's going on. And this should not come as a surprise, this kind of appearance at laparoscopy. This is entirely predictable by ultrasound. This is what we call a frozen pelvis. So ultrasound and endometriosis, a routine pelvic ultrasound looks at the uterus and the ovaries. Um, you really need to look for deep endometriosis, for mobility and site-specific tenderness. The IDEA group published this paper back in 2016 and they gave us two things. They gave us a language to use, a common language that sonographers and surgeons can use the same words um, and gave us a system for how to look for endometriosis. The language is terribly important. So in this image, you can see the bladder, the uterus and the bowel. Um, if you draw a line through the cervix, through the internal os, then behind that is the torus. If you draw another line underneath the cervix, 
um, than the area in orange now. This is the rectovaginal septum. So all these words are from the idea classification. It's important we all speak the same language. This now is the posterior vaginal fornix. This is the pouch of Douglas. And this is the bowel below the, um, this green line. Below the level of the torus is the lower rectum. The bowel above it is the upper rectum. And if you draw a line with the uterine fundus, then bowel above that level is called sigmoid. So this is slightly arbitrary, but if we all use the same words, we'll all know what we're trying to say. We call this area behind the uterus the posterior compartment, and common locations for deep endometriosis are in the posterior vaginal fornix, at the torus, in the lower rectum, and in the upper rectum. And sometimes you have all of them together and um, adherent to each other, and that's called a frozen pelvis. So how do I apply the idea um, structure? Uh, this is how I do it. I start with a systematic routine pelvic ultrasound, always looking for features of endometriosis. Um, these would be adenomyosis, an ovarian endometrioma and ovarian adhesions. Important to say that I ask patients to come with an empty bladder, but I do not use a routine bowel prep and that I'm really gentle. The more gentle you are, the better you will see. Then to make sure that the patient's bottom is overhanging the edge of the couch with either knee supports or feet on a chair. And then I will say many times during the scan, let your knees go floppy because this really helps all the muscles to relax and the views will be much better and the scan will be much less uncomfortable. I slowly insert the probe the normal way with plenty of lubricant on the outside and then perform a systematic pelvic scan also noting mobility and tenderness. For women with deep endometriosis um, or ovarian endometriomas, I will also do a transabdominal renal scan because up to 3% of such women have silent hydronephrosis. Important that you understand how I orientate my probe. So if this is a patient lying down, there's the transvaginal probe and I have the marker uppermost. Um, this fan of sound is emitted from the probe and it is then translated onto a screen and you notice that I've got the marker um, top left and that corresponds to the upper level of the probe there. The other side of the fan of sound is displayed on that side of the screen so it's essentially like you have the patient lying underneath the screen and this is what that would look like. So we've got the bladder there the vagina and uterus and the bowel at the back. So this is my orientation. Now some people do scan the other way up um, but in all my images this is what how I do it. So we start with a systematic pelvic scan looking for features of endometriosis. So firstly if a uterus is anti-verted but retroflexed you've got to think about why is it being pulled backwards and it's usually because of adhesions. The other thing to look for is adenomyosis and here you can see that there's uh, features of diffuse adenomyosis uh, causing a bulky globular uterus, small myometrial cysts, stripy shadows and a very indistinct endomyometrial junction. It can look differently that you have islands of endometrium in the myometrium as in this case all those little white areas are endometrium in the myometrium like all of these here and if you do a 3D image you can then see that you've got a very irregular endomyometrial junction. The other thing to look for is ovarian endometriomas and here you can see an image of a, an antiverted uterus and a very low ovary and we can see that there's a cyst and using the iota terminology this is a unilocular cyst there's no solid component with ground glass echogenicity cyst contents. If you then go to the transverse plane, you can see that this endometrioma is actually adherent to the uterus and that's why it's low. And if you can compare that to the other side, this is the right ovary, you can see that this ovary cantilevers because this ovary is free, there's no adhesions there. So this is an ovarian endometrioma um, adherent to the uterus um, low down. Now ovarian endometriomas are very rarely isolated. You've got to look for deep endometriosis at this stage. 
and this in the transverse plane is a view of kissing ovaries where you've got bilateral endometriomas this one is anechoic that sometimes happens and they are adhering to each other and to the uterus You will all have seen these where you're doing a scan and this is the level of the internal os and you see the ovary and it's low and you'll also will have noticed that there's a lot of whiteness around it we'll, we'll talk about that later but in the transverse view you can see this ovary is low because it's adherent to the ligaments so having done a normal systematic routine pelvic ultrasound specifically looking for those features next i'll do the sliding sign the sliding sign was published in um, 2013 and it's something that we should absolutely do in every single pelvic scan that we uh, perform. This is a normal sliding sign. This uterus is anteverted because the, the bladder is here. It's to go toward the bladder. And you can see here that there is movement on very gentle movement of my probe. It's a transvaginal probe. I'm doing this with one hand, just very gently inserting the probe a little bit more. And you can see that the bowel moves one way and the cervix moves the other. There's entirely free mobility behind the uterus. And if you can compare that to this case, here again, you can see the cervix. This is the back of the uterus. You can see things move, but it all moves together. And that's because all of this is adherent to the back of the cervix. Next, I'll look for nodules of deep endometriosis. So what is deep endometriosis? This is when the lesions extend for more than five millimeters underneath the peritoneum, causing cyclical bleeding with inflammation and fibrosis. And you end up with these irregular hypoechoic solid nodules, minor vascularity, surrounded by brightly echogenic fibrosis. So that would be the deep endometriosis and that's the fibrosis surrounding it. And I'll show you some examples. Now we find these in the posterior compartment, in the vagina, in the ligaments and in the bowel, and in the anterior compartment, in the bladder and the ureter. Looking at the vagina then, um, this is the transvaginal probe being inserted just behind the cervix, and there you can see that there's a nodule of deep endometriosis actually in the vagina. If you don't look while you're putting your probe in, you'll miss it. You've got to look when inserting the probe. So I've inserted the probe to just behind the cervix and there is the posterior vaginal fornix is abnormal. And on speculum examination, you can just see this bluish nodule through the um, epithelium, but you, you could miss that. Deep endometriosis is commonly in the ligaments behind the cervix, in the torus and uterosacral ligaments, and I need to explain what I mean by that. This again is that laparoscopy image of the back of the uterus. This is the torus. It's a really important area uh, for us, and the torus is where the right and the left uterosacral ligament insert on the back of the cervix. This is usually where deep endometriosis centers, so it's important to uh, learn how to see that view. That's the pouch of Douglas. That's where you'd get the deep endo. So how to look at the torus um, in 2D? So what we're going to do is um, look at where the bladder attaches to the uterus. That's that white line. If you draw a straight line from that, you're at the level of the internal os. Go back further. This is the torus. This is where the ligaments insert on the back of the cervix there. So if I'm going to go live, I'm going to go longitudinal just to center. I'm now rotating anti-clockwise to a transverse plane and I can now see the uterosacral ligaments. And you can't really see them because they are normal, but they are these little white lines just to the side. If I let it play once more, I'm going to rotate. The torus is here. This is one uterosacral ligament, this little fine white line. And this is the other one just there. So those are normal uterosacral ligaments look through the anterior fornix. I've got the cervix here and I'm looking through the cervix. So normal in the longitudinal and the transverse views. And this is when it's not normal. And what you notice here really is the whiteness. You notice this hyperechoic tissue with some hypoechoic tissue in it. This is deep endometriosis in the uterosacral ligaments, which have become very thick and fibrotic. And if you look in the transverse plane, you can see that these ligaments are thick and fibrotic there. So this is how you can look at the uterosacral ligaments and look for DE within them through the anterior fornix.
now looking through the posterior fornix as another way of looking at them. And in this case, this uterus is retroverted and the bladder is up here, so it tips toward the feet. And we're going to look through the posterior vaginal fornix, the cervix is up there. We're going to look at this area and I'll show you that we can suddenly see the uterosacral ligament. I'm going laterally a little bit. There's the uterosacral ligament. And as I'm pressing on it, it becomes applied to the posterior vaginal fornix uh, and the peritoneum. And what you can see is that there is the vagina in the posterior fornix, it's hypoechoic. The peritoneum is hyperechoic and the uterosacral ligament is just there. And you could see as I pressed very gently, I can press the uterosacral to the peritoneum and the vagina. And so there is a normal uterosacral ligament. So if you know that that's where it is um, through the posterior fornix, you can now also recognize when it's abnormal. Uh, looking through the posterior fornix, because we're looking very close to the probe, you need to use high frequency, including harmonics, and move your focus up. So the focus is up here at this area. And you can see there's an irregular hypoechoic nodule of deep endometriosis surrounded by white fibrosis. So we've looked at the vagina, we've looked at the ligaments, now we're going to look at bowel. What does bowel endometriosis look like? Well, firstly, what does a normal posterior vaginal fornix look like? That's the fornix by definition. There is the internal os and the torus. And so now I'm just going to show you what a normal posterior fornix looks like. There's a little bit of uh, air in the vagina here, um, which is making it stand out. And so you can see really clearly this here is the posterior vaginal fornix. And we need to look at bowel through that area. So we're going to move the probe from the anterior fornix, which is where we usually scan from. We're going to move it into the posterior fornix. And that way we'll be able to see the bowel much better. So I'm just very gently um, moving, angling the probe toward the sacrum more and saying to the patient, let your knees go floppy because it really, really helps. Now we're in the posterior fornix. You can see a little bit of free fluid and you can see normal posterior vagina and normal peritoneum normal uterosacrum and uh, sacral ligaments. So when you're in the posterior vaginal fornix, of course, we've got the, the uterus is out of the way um, and we're looking at this area here. Now there's a little bit of free fluid, which is great because it means I can see this is lower rectum. We're way below the level of the torus. And you can see that the normal bowel has got lots of layers. So it's a hyperechoic serosa. Um, then we've got the muscularis submucosa and mucosa, um, and then serosa again. And this is the muscularis layer. This is the most important layer. It's a dark layer with a little fine white fibrous layer within it. And that's the outer longitudinal muscle layers and the inner circular muscle layers. So this is a normal muscularis. It's the most important layer of the bowel and it's usually actually quite easy to find. So those are the bowel walls. It's the anterior wall and the posterior wall. And this is the bowel lumen going toward the, the rectum, the anus, that way. When you've got deep endometriosis in the bowel, this is the layer that it's in. It's in the muscularis layer. So very easy to, to spot because you've got this dark, thick, hypoechoic line and that little fibrous line has become disrupted or is absent. So instead of it looking like this, it looks like that. So that's deep endometriosis in the bowel wall. So this is what that bowel nodule looks like. So we're in the lower rectum, we're below the level of the torus, uh, thick muscularis. And you need to track the normal muscularis going in and the normal muscularis going out. Um, so that's the muscularis, that's the submucosa and mucosal layer. On the other side of the bowel wall, so we're crossing the lumen now, normal muscularis on the other side and uh, normal serosa beyond that. So this is one bowel wall that's the other bowel wall, so you can see how abnormal it is. We always put colour on just to make sure that you're not missing a tumour, but this is not a tumour, this is deep endometriosis. If this was on the other side, you would really need to think about tumour, but this is, this is not malignant, this is just deep endometriosis. So I'm going to show you some video examples. So there you can see a uterus that's a bit antiverted and retroflexed. And you can just see just there a big bowel nodule. It's dark, it's hypoechoic, surrounded by this white fibrosis. And bowel lesions are often 
um, in many different places. And in this same patient, she had another nodule of deep endometriosis uh, very high in the, in the sigmoid colon. This is a different patient, and here you can see a low stock ovarian endometrioma, uh, antiverted retroflexed uterus, and you can see another endometrioma there. And then she also has a bowel nodule just there, big bowel nodule. And this is a scan through the posterior fornix looking at uh, the lower rectum. You can see normal muscularis, and then you can see that it becomes very, very thick and abnormal just there and you can see it's got a uh, submucosa overlying it and you can also see deep endometriosis in the uterosacral ligaments. This is another example I could see the endometriosis through the anterior fornix but to see better I'm going to go through the posterior fornix tracking that muscularis layer as I go and then when in the posterior fornix you can see this big nodule of deep endometriosis in the anterior muscularis layer and there's also, again, there's deep endometriosis in the ligaments in between the vagina, the ligaments and the bowel. And you always need to measure them separately. And you can see the overlying submucosa. Mucosa is so bright um, that it actually makes this stand out rather a lot. Another example. This patient has an antiverted uterus. She's got a huge section of deep endometriosis in the bowel wall and a big ovarian endometrioma. There's the endometriosis in the bowel wall and there's the ovarian endometrioma. Another thing the surgeons really need to know and you can show them is in the posterior compartment, does it affect all or just some of the layers? And in this case, you can see that there's deep endometriosis in the vagina, it's in the ligaments, and it's in the bowel. And it's very important to point this out to the surgeon and before surgery. So here we can see it's in the posterior fornix, it's in the uterosacral ligaments, and there's a bowel nodule. You can tell more about the bowel still, whether it's deep or superficial, if it involves the vagina, how low it is, and whether it's stenosing. And there are other videos to, to talk about that. So I hope that I've shown you that um, with a frozen pelvis, ultrasound can see so much more than laparoscopy. Um, remember at ultrasound and laparoscopy, the images are the other way around. Um, but that was the laparoscopy. And these are the ultrasound images of that patient. You can see here that she has a frozen pelvis. Here in the transverse view, you can see that she has a big ovarian endometrioma, which is that one. Um, and that's the other ovary and everything is glued to each other. So they're kissing ovaries and a frozen pelvis. But what you can also see that you would not know this way is that she's got bowel endometriosis too. Having looked at the posterior compartment, I then go to the anterior compartment. Because I ask patients to come with an empty bladder or ask them to empty just before we go into the scan room, the bladder is empty at the beginning of the scan, but by the end there's some urine and you can then see deep endometriosis in the bladder. This was uh, a very large nodule. This one is smaller. You can see deep endometriosis in the bladder wall. And here you can see deep endometriosis near the bladder. And this is more of an extension of adenomyosis. But again, it's, it's close to the bladder wall. Very important to look at the ureters, and there are separate videos about that. Mainly with endometriosis, it's external compression from the fibrosis that causes the damage. And here you can see um, an ovary that's glued to the pelvic side wall. There's some deep endometriosis at the torus. Um, and you can see that this ureter is, is adherent to the ovary and very narrowed by fibrosis. And then it widens above as the kidney is at this end and the urine is finding it difficult to pass into the bladder. To be able to see this, don't forget to increase your depth of field to include the area above the ovary. And don't forget to look at the kidneys. This is in fact a different patient. It's just to make the point that sometimes you're very surprised that suddenly there's gross hydronephrosis on that side. So always check the kidneys in women with any endometriosis.
and I do soft markers at the end. So at the end of the scan, having reminded the patient again to please let your knees go floppy, I will go from area to area and I know what I'm doing because I can see where I'm touching. It'll be the uterus or the adnexa or the, the ovary or the bowel and look to see, is this sore, is this sore, is this sore? And you can work it out. And if there's an area that's particularly tender, you need to look there particularly because there may well be some endometriosis there that you didn't see yet. And for every organ that you're looking at, look to see, is it mobile? Is it freely mobile? And just sometimes you need to put your right hand, uh, your left hand on the patient's abdomen while you're pressing with, with the probe in the right hand. But often that's not necessary. So I hope that I've shown you that there's, you can see deep endometriosis on ultrasound. And here's a little medley of the images that we've just looked at together. So how to learn this? You start by looking for the sliding sign in all your patients. Practice looking at the torus. Look through the posterior fornix for nodules of deep endometriosis. Always keep endometriosis in your mind. Could there be some? If you go looking for it, you'll find it. And don't exclude endometriosis for, with a normal scan, particularly not when you're learning. And be gentle. I think this is incredibly important. Thank you.